Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Jervin. I am a journalist with DevEx, and I um, will be moderating the next session where we dig into these ideas around resilient health systems in Africa a bit further. Um, so if I could please uh, ask to come to the stage Cyril Sek, who is a, a digital strategy advisor for Africa CDC, and Dr. Abari Okareke, who is the chief executive officer of the Africa Public Health Foundation. Thank you both for, for joining us. So one of the, the big issues around resilient health systems is sustainable funding. And there is kind of two layers to that, domestic donor funding. Um, Cyril, I'm wondering if you can start us off and talk about the landscape around domestic funding and what you would like, to, uh, an Africa CDC would like to see change in that regard. Sure, thank you for the question. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd say that if we look at the, the, the past few years, domestic health funding has been steadily improving. That's a fact. <laughs> and, and if we look at, uh, although it's not at the, the desired level yet, of course, uh, but if we look at the world uh, health expenditures um, you know, reports that are uh, being put by, by WHO, uh, what we've seen is that it is the government spending that has increased the most uh, out of um, out of the total spending, especially during the the, the COVID situation. Um, so I think we need to to maintain and amplify that momentum. We probably also need to make sure that governments invest a bit more into the routine uh, elements and that partners focus more on specific targeted uh, parts of the, of the operational plans, which means that governments need to take the lead and which means that we need to invest in them. Thank you so much. Um, turning, can I just follow up on that? Um, I think it's important to actually, first of all, it's a, thanks for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here. A tough act to follow His Excellency, he's quite the, the rapporteur. Um, I think clear about what we mean when we refer to domestic financing. Do we mean public sector as in government defined uh, from whatever the, the nation's resources are, or are we actually talking about financing that comes out of that within that space, whether it's from citizens or from government? Because um, I think if, you, if we look at both, then we can see that, that the picture is not actually as bad as the, the rhetoric would suggest. Like Cyril said, yes, there has been an increase in domestic um, public sector, government-defined funding. That was mostly COVID-driven, and I'm, be, I'm slightly more pessimistic than Cyril is. A lot of that has dipped back down post-COVID as a consequence of the debt that a lot of countries, not just low middle income countries in Africa, but beyond, are facing as a consequence of the COVID response and the economic downturn. So even those countries that crept towards that Abuja declaration percentage or 15% of your annual budget, um, I've heard a, a health minister refer to the fact that, you know, 15% of an elephant is not the same as 15% of a chicken. So it is it is challenging. Um, the, the, the direction of travel is in the right one in the sense that if there's anything that came out of the COVID uh, pandemic was a recognition by maybe traditionally less um, enthusiastic about health uh, finance ministers that investment in the health sector is critical. And I use the term investment, not spend, because in most countries, the health sector is one of the largest employers. It is a generator of income and it is a foundation for all your other parts of your economy to exist. So we, I, I share your optimism in that the direction of travel is right, but it is quite slow. And then turning to donor financing, so the Africa Public Health Foundation focuses on raising funds for, for Africa CDC. Um, I am wondering if you can comment on, and I think this kind of builds off a conversation that just a session um, we had recently looking at government priorities and kind of uh, donors and NGOs aligning with government priorities. Would you say uh, kind of generally or majority of donor funding is kind of donor driven or do you see that kind of partnership with governments around priorities? Um, additionally, you. Uh, uh, get you um, edited a series in Think Global Health recently where you, you also talked about kind of investing in NGOs versus investing in governments. 
So um, I'll start by saying I, I don't think the rhetoric is, first of all, that level of generalization is not necessarily helpful. There is as much diversity in how donors make their decisions as they are donors and, and countries that receive those, those uh, investments. Um, but I, I see a trend towards alignment. Um, from the big to the small donors. And oftentimes what is actually missing is something to align within or against. Um, one of the challenges that we have, and which I, I'm very pleased again, feeling very optimistic, is changing, is very clear strategic priorities at national level, at regional level, at continental level, alongside which donors can then bring their own contribution. Um, and we have seen traditionally, particularly in emergencies, that um, the, the Disasters Emergencies Fund, for example, um, and more recently in Africa, Nigeria had the private uh, coalition against COVID. South Africa had the South African Solidarity Fund, where in an emergency, they were able to actually pool resources from all sectors against the common strategic ambition. We're now looking to see how do we leverage that experience into routine health investment. The foundation that I lead was established specifically to, to, to start to do that. How do we bring the vast array of donors to align with the strategic priorities of the continent? Um, and we're seeing in, in different, at different levels in different countries, similar approaches. But coordination is difficult. Partnership is difficult. And it requires investment, intentional investment of capacity. And unfortunately, too often are underfunded health institutions, whether they're ministries, independent, national public health agencies, whatever, do not have the capacity in terms of manpower expertise whose sole purpose is coordination ensuring that there is clarity so that our focus is this is what our government wants to do in this space and if you're interested in working alongside that then let us work together. That capacity is often limited, but it's changing. There's an increasing recognition that the efficiency of any sources of funding is improved when you have that better alignment between the strategic ambition and the donor's interest. There are still, of course, um, examples where, um, like as was in the panel earlier uh, this afternoon, where donors turn up and say, here's, you know, pull out a plan from the back of the pocket and say, this is what we're going to do. But I like to think that is increasingly less common and um it's the the Afri new public health order which goes on very strongly about um new partnerships new approaches to to mutually beneficial trusted partnerships is pushing back clearly saying let us co-create um those solutions because that's how you have um, the best outcomes and in particular around efficiencies now, turning to, to digital innovations, Cyril, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about Africa CDC's strategy ar around digital health and, um, and, and some kind of innovations that you uh, think are quite promising on the continent. Sure, thank you. Uh, but first, I'd like to, to amplify and to piggyback on what Dr. Iberio was saying. Um, this idea that it is through collaboration, cooperation, coordination, um, that we, we will align all together because it's a very crowded area and we must align on the priorities defined by the countries is really how we define this strategy. So we started with many interactions with representatives from member states, um, different levels, different you know, stakeholders, listening to what their priorities were. And then we aligned on, on the vision. Um, then we had workshops and it was really a long process, a bottom-up process uh, where we were also trying to find our own voice, you know, not elbowing our way in, but trying how we could, you know, really bringing something to the table. And we align on a number of specific strategic objectives, seven of them, you, you can find them uh, on, on the internet. Uh, but more than the strategy, I think what was um, interesting was the, the process itself. We learn to work with governments. We learn to work with many partners, 75 of them now. And we uh, eventually came with a portfolio of 18 different projects uh, where we gather uh, organizations that see value in collaborating, in learning from their peers, in aligning with the 
uh, government priorities and in in getting that stamp from Africa CDC to be to be frank <laughs> so that they could even go further in their own resource mobilization strategies so what we're doing really is convening partners and aligning them on a few sequenced uh, series of custody project plans, uh, which is really what they want, you know, from the UN system to, to uh, implementers, and I see many of them here. Um, it's a process, uh, it's an ongoing discussion. It's not purely one strategic plan, it's more like a series of iterations uh, so that we, we end up being a, a team. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to have a few uh, specific points, so we're working first on making sure that there is a data space, that there is health data available to all. When I say all, it's it's both the the academics, but also the innovators, uh, the startups. If we don't have local data sets, then we cannot innovate. And very often, our countries are way too small in order to to to. To, to, to provide, uh, you know, the, the, the space for innovation to flourish. So we're also working on making sure that there is continental guidance and, and standardization of processes so that we can work on larger uh, scales. Um, so data is one, then there is the digitization of primary healthcare. Uh, which starts with the basics, so electricity, often solarization, but also moving to connectivity and then three specific use cases, vaccination, uh, surveillance, and you may know that, you know, you have IDSR, but also even based surveillance. We focus on even based surveillance at Africa CDC, which is basically uh, collecting, uh, you know, different pieces of data <laughs> and AI, or digital, generally speaking, or statistics, if you want to play it simple, <laughs> um, is how you make sense out of, uh, 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 out of the, the, the data. So digital will be extremely important when it comes to strengthening uh, surveillance. Um, and we're working with a number of, of partners to, to put together uh, solutions on that. Um, so apart from, um, so I say, uh, surveillance, uh, vaccination, and maternal health is the, the third topic. Those three verticals are large enough, strong enough, so that we have a platform to, to go beyond and even you know, address some very specific issues. Um, this is a process, once again. Uh, one of the issues is that we have so many solutions, <laughs> so many uh, competing uh, pilots and interesting projects. And we're really trying to not to recommend one over the other, but more say, this is a threshold. This is this is like the the the, the minimum requirements in order for um, uh, uh, solutions to be considered by a given country. Uh, so we're trying to be this honest broker um, that help countries make sound decisions um, in this complicated field of uh, digitization of public uh, of primary healthcare. Then there is also, of course, workforce development. There are plenty of new skills that are necessary. Um, at all levels, uh, both for clinicians and non-clinicians. Um, there, I think the, the question is, what are the targets? Mm. How many people should we train and where? And that's, uh, that's an important one. Uh, we, we don't have metrics right now. Mm. WHO doesn't have metrics, no one has. So we're launching a project around, on defining that in, in a series of, of countries. And then the idea would be, okay, so what should be the curricula and the certification mechanism in order to implement that? And that way we create a market for existing and new providers to, to train. Mm -hmm. So we're not in the business of delivering ourselves, but more like creating space for uh, the private sector and, and the, the implementers to, to flourish. Thank you. And just to bounce off that on, on workforce development, um, Avery, I'm wondering if you can talk about kind of what's needed to, to move forward with a more resilient workforce across the continent and what can be done to combat um, brain drain. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to step back a little bit, and as I, I want to do, I like to be clear about what we're talking about. So when we're talking about the health workforce, this isn't just about epidemiology. So what's always touted is that you know we need uh, um, we only have uh, 1,600 epidemiologists. We need how many thousand? But the health workforce is broader than that. It's from the family member who ends up being responsible, who stays home to look after whoever is ill. 
usually a woman, and permit me to get on my platform. Um, we can't discuss health workforce unless we look at the gender issue. Um, so it's from there all the way to the most highly specialized um, expert, you know, brain surgeon, um, that, um, that we need in the health system. And we also need to start, when we're thinking about workforce, to move away from the traditional definition of health workforce, which is, you know, a nurse who went to nursing school or a doctor who went to medical school, and recognize that there's a whole spectrum of people who contribute to the health system. They're all equally necessary in, the, in, in defining that health workforce. First and foremost and foundational to the health workforce is the front line, which is 90 to 90% delivered by women, a sign almost three quarters of them are unpaid or volunteers with slightly type stipends or they're paid intermittently. And, and, you know, I'm always arguing with people, there is no genetic uh, predilection to be on be to be in unpaid labor in women. Um, but they are the front line. They are the gap, as the DG mentioned, they are the, 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 the bridge between the citizen and the health system at whatever tier. And there are these big initiatives at the moment about addressing what number do we need, what are the standards, how do we, view, how do we define them, um, how do we train them, how do we pay them. Currently, we have as many different systems as there are regions and districts in the, on, across the continent. And so that approach to start to define what we actually want to solve for is good, is necessary. Then we actually need to define, are we solving it for the, the, the health sector of 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, where we're looking for healthcare workers who will work in a community, in a health center, or are we actually solving for the health sector of the future, where we have workers who are digitally equipped, knowledgeable, are able to work across systems, across districts, and across using the technological opportunities that we have to invest in. Because I, I spent a lot of my career working in the UK. The National Health Service that was defined in 1945 is creaking because it wasn't defined for modern healthcare and for the volume of demand on it. So we need to leapfrog that. We don't want to recreate those health systems. We need to therefore be thinking about the health workforce with the skills and the tools to be digitally enabled, to be able to work remotely, and to be able to deliver the new technology, but with a strong emphasis on prevention. Because if we focus only on a therapeutic, responsive health system, it will always be beyond our affordability. So those are the challenges that we have to, to talk about. And I want to come back to what we talked about, partnership and collaboration between public sector, NGOs, and private sector. I'm very excited about the Africa Frontline First initiative, for example, which is focusing on this primary healthcare workforce agenda and starting to pull together all interested parties across the spectrum to, to a common vision, pooled funding, clear strategic priorities, common standards, common goals, and clear indicators. That is one way of improving efficiency, but also ensuring that whatever the driver of the donor, the government, whatever their priorities are, they fall into a common vision that will result in what we're all trying to achieve, which is a workforce that is fit for the next century and for the citizens that, that the, the populations that we serve deserve. Now, brain drain is a, is a, is a unique and specific challenge here. And I, I think I'm in Geneva, so I'm going to look to the audience and say, as the electorates of the Global North, it is extremely frustrating that we, there's been reports in, over the years post-COVID uh, of the great resignation and of the health workforce in the West resigning and, and, and leaving the workforce. And the response for the Global North is, I, I live in Nairobi, health fairs coming to Nairobi to recruit our nurses. Now, Everybody says, oh, it's because they're not paid enough. That's not exactly, that's, I, as, a, as a health professional who worked, to, grew up and, and trained in Nigeria, those are not the only motivations for why people migrate. Funding is an issue, and in an economic downturn, poor, poorer countries are poorer, and their staff are less well paid. But I actually think that the Global North has a duty to actually look inwards and, and, and address the fact that it is being lazy. You know me, I don't cock, I don't means my words. It is, it is cheaper and easier for you to come and recruit nurses from Nairobi, to recruit daughters from Lagos, um, 
rather than expand your own training workforce. Change your health system delivery mechanism so it's not so health doctor nurse dependent. Do what we are doing, diversify. So it is one thing for um, uh, bilateral, multilaterals, donors in the NGO sector to come and tell us so we need to develop a strategy for community health workers. And I'm thinking, you could do with a bit of that too. Let's do this together. Uh, you might have more resources, but you're also draining our resources. But within our own, we have a duty, and it comes back to why I'm less optimistic about the do domestic investment. Our countries, our governments need to be more intentional about investing in the health sector. That includes recognizing the worth of their health workforce. It is far more expensive to retrofit than to actually, as you build your strategy to build the workforce you need and provide the incentives that keep them there. Career progression, a, com a work, a work um, contract that allows you to take time to study. If you're a woman and you have caring uh, responsibilities, unfortunately, still predominantly women. Sorry, I will keep diverting on that. Um, to ensure that the workplace, the workforce, the employer understands and accommodates that so that you don't have what tends to happen, which is when women um, uh, give birth, they exit the workforce. And, and so we have a duty to make it more attractive to stay than to go. And then you in the global north, in the west, in Switzerland, need to stop pulling them in, please. Um, then the final thing I want to say on, on the workforce is that until we address the gender equity issue, we on all sides of the divide, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, we will continue to struggle with this challenge because part of the reason why community health workers and health professionals are underpaid is because it's seen as women's work and women's work tends to be traditionally underfunded and underappreciated. Mm. Sorry, I'm a troublemaker. Oh, magnificent call of action, <laughs> as usual in the jury. <laughs> Um, so tomorrow morning, there is an event uh, led by Speak Up Africa uh, on African women in digital health, if you want to participate in that. <laughs> so that there is always a gender lens in, in, in digital uh, strategies and that, uh, you know, women and girls' uh, health issues are being tackled and that women are in the driving seat also, <laughs> uh, not only delivering uh, care. Um, let me maybe piggyback on, you may have other questions, but on, on one, one topic. Um, I think it is extremely important for governments in Africa, but also here in, in the north, in the global north, to understand the disruptive nature of digital health. Very often, what we come across is, um, you know, governments saying, well, uh, I will strengthen this part of my pyramid and this part and this part, and I want to diffuse uh, digital throughout. Well we can do so much more <laughs> than, than strengthening the existing system. Um, we can leapfrog, as you were saying, and we need to reinvent the way we deliver uh, uh, health services. And what it means is that um, within governments, we need strong teams that are anchored high enough to make those strategic decisions. And this is my, my call <laughs> of action. <laughs> Thank you both. That was a very powerful commentary. We're unfortunately out of time, but appreciate you both joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.